All okay. right, here we go. Go ahead, Alan, you got the robot dog. Yes, so the New York Police Department has rolled out for the second time a robot that they call DigiDog. It is a robot uh, created by Boston Dynamics, the robotics company that's come up with a number of creepy looking robots. <laughs> and uh, this, in this case, it was used, DigiDog was used to investigate a possible nobody was at home. So on the face of it, a rather benign situation. The dog only had a camera mounted to its top, a microphone and a speaker. However, symbolically, I'd like to point out that this is a rather significant event because although robots have been used by police departments for decades, in particular for uh, bomb disposal, this is the first time that, or rather the second time, that we have a robot that's more sophisticated that supposedly has uh, built in AI, although in this case for navigating uh, hallways and stairs. Um, and it could be just the first step in what ends up being the increasing roboticization, militarization of police departments everywhere because the, the technology could be used to say mount weapons um, or restraining technologies, um, not just a camera and a microphone and a speaker on it. So you know, this could be the beginning of a RoboCop yeah. technology. That won't happen for decades, of course, but looking back on it from say 20 years on, we could say that this is the first time or second time that more sophisticated technologies have been used for policing purposes. Well, I remember one about six months ago where there was this like shooter and they took like their bomb defusing robot and tied a bomb to it and blew him up. Oh, I missed that, was that one. What that was, was that? Like, they, they, this guy was like shooting a sniper or somebody shooting people and the cops just took their little robot and stuck like a hand grenade on it and crawled back there and blew him up with the robot, which I thought that was pretty brilliant, you know? <laughs> Yeah, not exactly the intended purpose of the robot, but it wasn't. Uh, but but they said, and they, people said, "You're you're using your robot to hurt people." He said, "Yeah," and I'm proud of it. I didn't have to get my officers shot and fight with that guy. We just used the most effective way to solve the problem. This was in the U.S. Yeah, Philadelphia or something, about six wow. months ago. Wow. So I think that there's there's clearly a willingness to use lethal uh, force with oh. these technologies. You're you're, you're pausing again, Alan. It said clang and then buzz. It's a little better, but you still got a buzzing going on. Wait, now it's better. Hmm. There, can you talk? I, I can talk if you can hear me. Yeah, it's, it's much better now. Okay, all okay. right, good, good, good. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, as I was saying, um, the police departments will clearly have an interest and a desire to use more sophisticated technology um, and potentially in lethal ways. So uh, although this particular application of the DigiDog is pretty harmless, I, I would say, mm -hmm. certainly in the future there are profound ethical uh, problems or conundrums that will arise. So we shall see. Well, I guess. I mean, it just seems like another bit of technology to me. But hopefully they don't give it AI and a weapon that it can fire without human intervention. Right, right. Exactly. Then we'd really be in Terminator territory. Yes. All right. And I never down to be, oh yeah, so I had a couple of voting ones here. So the Arizona Republicans are one of about more than a hundred bills being tried to pass by Republican states all over the place to try to suppress the vote. And this one here is, I think, the most bold. They want to give their legislature the right to do what a few of them tried this time, which is to take the electors chosen by the voters and just ignore them and send other electors to cast different votes at the Supreme Court so that the voters in their state will no longer control the presidential votes at all. They will just be overruled. And this is like what Hong Kong had for a while, where Hong Kong was allowed to have elections, but if you elect the wrong guy, China will come in and say, oh no, not that guy. And the legislatures would have that, that right in, 
in Virginia, in, 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 the, um, in Arizona. So there's about 100 of those trying to make it harder to vote and make the votes count less. But then there's one in Virginia that's actually good. The Amer United States had a period of democracy from 1965 to 2013, when you were not allowed to suppress the vote in this way. But in 2013, the Supreme Court reversed it and stopped supervising the states in the South so they could resume suppressing the vote, which they began to do vigorously. But the states have, they have uh, liberals in the states that would like to allow people to vote again. And Virginia is now passing their own version of what used to be the National Voting Rights Act which again would say you must have the ballots printed in multiple languages, you must have ability to vote a distance, you know, all these things that make it easier to vote. And so some of the Southern states are stepping up. And I've heard about this. There's these people in the South that say, no, we want to have a new South that is no longer racist and trying to stop Black people from voting. And these movements are growing. So I see that as a hopeful sign. The, the federal Supreme Court seems to have irretrievably uh, abandoned this position but the states might step up and uh, try to make it easier to vote and try to make sure that all the votes are actually counted and such. So we'll see. But well, it's rare that I have good news on this matter, but there's a bit of good news from Virginia. Anyway, then we got Liz with Twitter's hacking label. Yes, I, I uh, this story warmed my cold little heart. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny because uh, Twitter came out with this designation uh, for uh, news articles or um, tweets that uh, where they say this, uh, they, they give you a warning that um, these materials may be obtained through hacking. And uh, because the internet is the internet, folks immediately found a way to hack the uh, warning label hack. Uh, of hacking and uh, so apparently now they didn't get very specific about this and I didn't go fully down the rabbit hole but there's a way to combine um, two, uh, two URLs in order to make this warning label appear on anything you want. Um, I'm guessing it's just like a query string or something like that, but um, you can craft the link so to just about anything and they did, they actually did uh, they did a uh, couple experiments with it um, with their own websites and it was pretty funny. Yeah, you know, these labels that pop up saying this tweet may contain swearing. I see those all the time on tweets that don't contain swearing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, whatever signs those labels is a defective AI that's easily fooled. A lot of this, uh, a lot of this um, social media filtering is like that. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it also will uh, cause, you know, it'll cause certain articles to be um, flagged as misinformation too, that maybe aren't really misinformation. So I think they need to, uh, I think I think that the, the tech hasn't caught, you know, that their uh, technical, they're gonna need to pare down their technical debt before they uh, decide to go full cancel culture because it's not that effective right now. Yeah, they should rewrite it in COBOL. Well, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna uh, depend on, of course, how much the uh, censorship from the government is pushed. That's why I know Facebook just recently issued a proclamation saying, "Well, you guys just pass some rules and then we'll obey the rules." The current situation is. Just that uh, don't make anyone mad, and that's not very effective as a rule. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I, it's it's a fine line too. Like you really don't know. Um, you really, it's it's really hard to um, say how it should be. I mean, I'm kind of a fan of the free market model on this one where you you know each pri each platform is is sort of the equivalent of like going into a, a privately owned bar or restaurant where they get to make the rules on, on what's going to get you kicked out. You know, some places you, you got to have a, you've got to have a, a, a sport coat and a tie if you want to go to dinner and other places you just got to have shoes and a t-shirt. So. Well, I think I like that, but that has to go along with what Kerry Goldberg says, which is repeal 230. Because once you get rid of 230, then people can sue and say, your post harmed me, and they get a chance to go argue that in court. Right now, you know, if, if somebody like posts horrible things about you and ruins your life, there's nothing you can do about it because they're yeah. protected by Section 230. And it seems like 
uh, maybe it'd be best to just hold them to the same standards as TV and newspaper, where they have some responsibility for what they post. But anyway, that's a big argument, and I hear a lot of people yelling on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the other problem, too, I guess, is that on the other side of that argument is that it uh, protects the websites from liability for user generated content. But it's like, you know, there, there are ways to, you could repeal it and then put something better in place. It's not necessarily an either or situation. Yeah, well, you know, but in a way they ought to just you don't want them just publishing anything. They publish medical misinformation, voting uh, voting information. So now they are, in fact, filtering some stuff from their platform. So they could do it. They could say, look, you know, you can't post uh, stuff that really hurts people. And when you do, you really have to figure out how to take it down. I think we must place that burden upon them. They can't just say, like Facebook keeps saying, oh, it's just impossible for us to find all the Nazi stuff and take it down. They say, no, it's not. You could find it. <laughs> You should pay what it costs to really find it and take it down. They uh, like that costs money. Well, they at the same time they have it. I remember being at a, a Facebook developer conference, and this was probably three years ago now. Uh, yeah, because we didn't have anything last year, and um, they were demoing this product on on stage that could. Uh, identify, they use machine learning, they could identify, um, to the, they showed two photographs and one was of a, a block broccoli floret and the other one was of a cannabis bud. And they were so proud of this product that they'd figured out how they could uh, identify posts that were, um, you know, somebody selling weed on, on Facebook versus somebody posting a, a, a vegetarian broccoli recipe. So, I mean, they do have the technology. Yeah. All right, and then Urban's got a video on how to get your security dream job. This was from the OWASP Bay area, teaming up with the Bay, uh, with OWASP Vancouver. And by the way, for listeners, if you are not signed up to OWASP, you should, it's free. Uh, they have great talks every month. And this one was just a, a team up of two, two chapters. It's two and a half hours long, but it talks about how to get your, your security job in various forms and various angles from like the tech recruiter standpoint, your resume, all kinds of stuff. Great, great talks from a number of speakers throughout that video. This is a huge topic among my students, of course. Last night we had student presentations in my CISSP class. And after the presentations, they just started discussing advice and what jobs are available and what pay scale and just went on for about an hour everyone was very interested it's of course a hot topic among our students yeah yeah so i think this is a good video for our students to watch yeah yeah it's good because i don't know much about it but uh i'm glad the experts can chime in yes and alan you've got something of medical device cybersecurity. boy we need that yes this is my cybersecurity feel-good story of the week because the FDA has named the first acting director of medical device cybersecurity. FDA, of course, being the American Food and Drug Administration. And uh, this, is, this is an all new position. So this acting director is uh, a, uh, an associate professor at the University of Michigan, Kevin Fu. And he has a background in not only academics, but also in the private sector he co-founded a very small company, a boutique firm that performs penetration tests of medical devices, I believe. Good. And uh, so, yeah, so this is somebody with real technical shops and a real background in this field. And he, he, his is not an enforcement position, but it is a very important first step in bridging the gap between uh, regulation, the FDA, and medical device manufacturers. And apparently they've, they've got something like 50 different uh, stakeholders, 50 different uh, organizations and companies that are involved in this effort. And uh, so the uh, FDA is clearly emphasizing now the need for cybersecurity in medical devices. And uh, Fu's whole point is to integrate security into the medical device development cycle. So rather than 
uh, trying to tack on security at the very end when it's too late. Um, this really marks the beginning of an effort, industry-wide effort, hopefully, in which security is a primary focus from the outset. That sounds wonderful. I hope yes. they actually, you know, have enough teeth to get something done. Right. Yeah. The, right. There's there's no regulatory enforcement uh, uh, brief to this position, but uh, at least as far as fostering communication and developing standards, I think this is a very important development. And hopefully, this is exactly the kind of position that will be applied to um, other uh, other fields. You know, we could certainly use improved uh, cybersecurity in the development of other types of hardware and software out there. Yeah, like cars, for example. Like cars, yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. And then, so th this one I've been struggling to get straight. There's now a Bitcoin exchange traded fund. Over like the last two weeks, Bitcoin has been getting much more seriously uh, respectable. Elon Musk put a one and a half billion dollars in Bitcoin and a uh, serious Norm Visa got involved in Bitcoin. So major financial industry monsters that actually matter are getting involved in Bitcoin. And now there's an exchange traded fund. So you can buy this fund instead of buying Bitcoin directly. And what I don't understand is what the fund does for you, except charge a 1% transaction fee. But apparently they do something. And so there must be something involving buying and selling at strategic times or moving from one asset class to another. That's what funds are supposed to do. But anyway, the point is they're trying to get normal, regular investors like people's pension funds into cryptocurrency. And Bitcoin enthusiasts have been trying this for a long time. And now it seems to really be happening. So against the dogged resistance of those people stuck in the mud like me, they continue to whine about trivial little things like there's actually nothing holding up Bitcoin. Nobody else cares about that except funny duddies like me. The rest of them are just willingly riding it up into the clouds. And so anyway, it appears like it's going to be taken more and more seriously and just become a normal national currency. And the fact that there's no nation under it is just doesn't matter. <laughs> well, so, you're not the only one who's, who's uh, kind of scratching their heads with this. I think yeah. you can very readily identify them. Anybody who was involved in any kind or in the serious financial industry about 10 years ago all has this attitude like, wait, there are rules in the financial industry. <laughs> and apparently not anymore. But anyway, um, and then there's a fun one where a crypto exchange act made a mistake on their website and sold Bitcoin at 10% of the right price for a while. And now they're trying to say, hey, hey, give those back. Wait. You paid too low a price. And their lawyers are saying, we don't have to give it back. You sold me this stuff. You sold it at the wrong price. That's your problem. But uh, then, it's uh, so I, I've been telling everybody to avoid Bitcoin like the plague. And I still feel that way, but it's beginning to look like it's going to be a part of the established uh, financial cycle. And uh, we're just going to have to get used to it. <laughs> I've been sort of hoping it would just go away, but that is not what's happening. <laughs> Anyway, then I got Liz with cyber diplomacy. Yes, so I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, there's actually a bill uh, right now, the uh, Cyber Diplomacy Act of 2021, which sounds very futuristic and... Um, yeah, sounds great. Yeah, so uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, in that uh, it's going to establish an international office, uh, Office of International Cyberspace Policy with the State Department. So um, yeah, we, we definitely need it. Uh, they want to consolidate uh, some power around um, uh, international leadership as it relates to cybersecurity um, and uh, creates uh, uh, some, some policy um, formation on this stuff because we desperately need it. Clearly, we're pretty weak in this area. And uh, with the way that the threat landscape has evolved over, uh, I mean, just the past year, but especially the past five to 10 years, I mean, we're overdue for this. So um, I hope that it passes and I hope that we do a good job uh, standing it up well, well, now, wait a minute. You keep saying it's important, but it sounded to me like just a bunch of meaningless buzzwords. What is it going to do? <laughs> well, they're, first, they're going to, uh, I, I mean, from what I my takeaway from this was that 
one of the most important things that they're going to do is actually set policy and, you know, maybe uh, do something to enforce it, uh, which I think is really important. Um, second of all, uh, I suspect that uh, since it's going to be part of the State Department, um, you know, the intent behind this is to uh, set, to, to, to lead a better um, campaign to uh, strengthen our, our national defenses against stuff like, uh, you know, the recent, uh, well, recent and, uh, and uh, recent being over the past five to 10 years, hacks that we've been getting from uh, uh, nation state attackers. So we're going to do something to North Korea and China by means of this? And, and, and maybe even Russia. I, all right, I'm, I'm going to wait and see what they do, but I, I'm not sure that limiting arms control on the internet is off the table because the United States will never do that because we are the number one aggressor. I'm just, I'm expecting this to be a meaningless regulatory body where all the important issues are off the table, but. It very well could be. And that's why I say that I hope that we stand it upright because it's all in the execution. So, yeah. um, but I do think that it's a move in the, in the right direction. And I'm, I'm hoping too, um, from one of my other takeaways from it was that it's also going to focus on diplomacy. So if we can um, foster some cooperative um, relationships with other countries um, and maybe work together like we should be because uh, because they're being targeted too. In fact, my next story is going to be about that. If, if we work together, uh, it's going to be a lot more effective, I think. Okay. And we're already doing that with other types of crime, so. Okay, well, maybe. All right, and then we got OWASP top 10 for API. Yeah, I remember you, I saw this, you put this on Twitter. I did. So what I like about this, it's another in the browser free exercises. Uh, they, oh. they aren't in depth like, uh, like Web Security Academy, oh. but, but you can learn the basics like broker, broken user authentication, for example. It gives you a nice little step-by-step -step what, uh, like what the little story is and it helps you get through the, the whole process. Oh, I didn't understand that. That's why I thought it was just a top 10 list. It's got little exercises. Yes, it has little exercises cool. that are perfect for introducing. Oh, yeah. So this, to me, their little free exercises could be a perfect, even before Web Security Academy. Like here, oh. let's, let's do these little simple things that have a nice little story. And then let's go to the Web Security Academy to dive even deeper. Oh, yeah. Well, suddenly this is interesting. I'm glad you told me about it. I'll have to do these and maybe throw them in my class. Yeah, they, they are super simple. They don't require much knowledge. Like a lot of the things that you need to do, you can really just copy and paste. They, have, they, have, they tell you exactly what to do, what to click on, but that's perfect for getting started. You know, I see excessive data exposure here. And that reminds me of something shocking I learned last night. Some student had a, a give a talk about a graph of how many records are being lost per year, how many million, and that actually went down in the last year. I didn't know it ever went down. And also, there was a student from Amazon that said Amazon changed their defaults. So when you make Amazon buckets, they're not open to the world anymore. And I think these two may be causally connected. But anyway, another possibility, of course, is that due to COVID, they're not keeping good records of the breaches over the last year. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it appear to go down. But if the actual number of records lost per year actually went down, that's like headline news because it's been going up like a rocket for 10 years. Yeah. yeah anyway. so, this, so this side I think is great for our students to, to again, get started before they go into the Web Security Academy. I'm, I'm gonna put this, this before that now. Okay, well, I'm really glad to see more about it and I may be using that, that's good. All right, and Alan has got a Mexican politician. Yes, another Brian Krebs special here. Mm -hmm. The, <laughs> but it's a good one. Um, it, the the former head of Mexico's Green Party has been well now removed from office. The Green I, Party? I thought yeah. they were supposed to be the good guys. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's the thing, isn't it? You'd you'd expect it to be the uh, the PRI instead, but no, uh, it's the Green Party, and apparently. He is accused of taking bribes from a group of Romanian ATM skimmers that have been active in 
uh, the state of Quintana Roo for the past no. years. Oh. And uh, that the, the state of Quintana Roo, of course, has a number of uh, tourists visiting because uh, of its location on the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and so this gang, this Romanian ATM skimmer gang has apparently been extremely successful. Brian Krebs estimates that they have at least a 10% share of the $2 billion ATM skimming uh, industry worldwide. And so this gang has apparently bought off a number of politicians in Mexico and anti-corruption uh, officials. So uh, no convictions have resulted yet, but uh, it's a widening investigation, and it looks like at least this one gang has quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of pull uh, in Mexico, and they've been extremely successful there. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how this shapes up. Yeah, I was listening to Jordan Harbinger show, and he was talking about how when he was in Mexico City, he got kidnapped, and he managed to like beat up the kidnapper and escape, but then he wandered through town and she got a ride from some random guy. And the guy said, he said, I think you better take me so I can report it to the police. And he said, nobody has told you. He said, never tell the police anything. If you tell the police that a crime gang has done anything, they will just sell you back to the crime gang for a kick. They're all in on it. They're all part of the gangs. You, you never go to the police for any reason ever. You might as well just shoot yourself in the head. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, well, this this ATM skimmer gang sounds pretty serious. They killed one of their own, yeah. um, so uh, they're they're certainly not afraid to use lethal force. Yeah, the, you know, Krebs really focuses on these crime gangs, like the Russian crime gangs. He has no fear, and he yeah. goes right there, interviews them on site, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I give him credit, you know, he, he's received a number of death threats from different uh, parties. And I, I don't think these, these parties are playing around, you know, like they're not just hackers. They, they actually have some real organized crime muscle too. Oh yeah. And they sent, they sent a SWAT team to his house. They sent yeah. a bunch of heroin to his house. I mean, he's messing with tough people. I'm amazed he's still alive. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, good for him. And uh, then I've got, uh, so I thought this was kind of fun. Um, so North Korea hacked into a website and they got into their secret um, subnet. And now they had to exfiltrate data from the isolated subnet, which is a common problem, but they had a good solution. They hacked into the router and reconfigured the router to be a proxy server. So I hadn't heard of that one before. That's a sort of new technique, a pretty obvious one when they think of it, but I hadn't thought of it before. And then I thought this was nice. There's a chart from, um, uh, uh, CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike has made a chart to sort of add to the, um, the list of all the cryptocurrency sites that we've seen from the MIT group, uh, MITRE. And um, they list all the hacking groups and how they are associated with each other. When they use each other's products, they cooperate. So they've tried to make a sort of industrial component flow chart of all the cybercrime groups and APT groups and how they cooperate and interact. So it seems like another level of uh, threat intelligence to add to the MITRE framework. And I sh I'm watching this, uh, this threat intelligence and threat actor assessment turn into a science from just sort of a, a bunch of random facts. Increasingly over the last several years, we have these ways to organize it so you can understand who's attacking you and what they're doing with the data and where they got the malware from and what nation state is supporting them and uh, increasing interest in solving that when people attack you and using it to plan your defenses. Anyway, then Liz has got Russian state hackers. Yes, so uh, like, just like we got targeted with the solar winds um, breach, they, the same uh, threat actors have been uh, also targeting other network monitoring solutions in other countries and um, you know, I this I like this article because it explained just a little bit of um, I think it was this one. It may have been a different article. Yes, this this article explains a little bit about how they do it, and it's just pathetic. I mean, I think I like groaned out loud when I was reading the attack vector the, because they um, reading about how they exploited the. the 
the software because uh, it's all like super basic old school web show attacks. It's built on Apache. I mean, they just uploaded a PHP shell. Yes. Uh, and I mean, it's just, it's brutal. Uh, and I mean, there are a bunch of these too. Uh, and and they, they fully, they fully backdoored it. Um, they got into everything, all these, and it makes sense. I mean, I was thinking about it and I was like, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense from the um, attacker perspective, just targeting all these network monitoring systems. It, wasn't there a password or something, or was it just a default password or something ridiculous like that? Uh, for this one, um, well, I, I know there was something like that in the Solar Winds one. Yeah. Um, but, I think uh, maybe they guessed the password. Yeah. Yeah, they they didn't say at the time. They like the 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 reporting agency didn't say um, what whether it was uh, whether they did, but I, I mean. Most likely. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think that's that's the dirty secret of all pen testing is almost everybody has like a door just flapping open somewhere in their network. Yeah, and I mean they, you know, they they were uh, vulnerable to all kinds of known um, known malware too. So. Yeah. So if we could get those international policies you were talking about, maybe we could do something about the Russians hacking everybody because they seem to have learned that they can just do anything and there'll be no consequences. Well, they can. And part of it is because we don't have any kind of standards in place for uh, doing our own security audits on this stuff. And it's just okay to, you know, it, it's like, it, it's almost like selling somebody like a bulletproof vest that's, that's made out of uh, lace or Swiss cheese. Like there's no, um, you know, you, you can sell these products that may be complete and total crap without performing any kind of, um, you know, maybe a better, maybe a better analogy is like autom automotive safety testing. Like you've got to go through a basic uh, battery of, of testing before you sell cars that are going to be street legal on the road. Yep. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't sell somebody, um, something that's just gonna uh burst into flames uh if there's a fender bender on the freeway like the ford pino you know so um we, maybe maybe part of this policy ought to be you know there's got to be a basic level of testing and securing these systems before you sell them especially if they're going to be used for um sensitive uh government uh applications yeah this reminds me of the texas power grid which is about that whole issue how about we deregulate it and don't bother with all those idiotic safety rules? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and I mean, that too was crazy because uh, th they really got the government, the state government good uh, on, on um, money too because of the way that they do their pricing. Uh, I, I saw an article that um, they hit Denton, Texas, which is a, a just north of Dallas, uh, Dallas suburb. They hit them with a... $75 million bill for one day, uh, right. which was more than they paid for the entire year last year uh, for power. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's the wild, wild west in so many ways. And I'm sure having seen government contracts and the way that goes, I am sure the companies that provide these solutions are soaking uh, <laughs> are soaking public funds for as much as they can possibly get for these these crappy solutions. <laughs> yep, yep. I heard on the Rachel Maddow show that the actual amount of money they're paying for electricity in Texas is in fact greater than California. So That's hilarious. The whole point was to make it cheaper, but apparently it's like Enron. They've somehow gamed it so you actually end up paying more and still having an unsecured grid. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, and, and Urban, the last one, you've got the Onion Share Anonymous Dropbox. Yes. So if you have a Raspberry Pi sitting around, you can turn it into an anonymous Dropbox using the Tor network now. Onion Share has received a number of updates where it finally works headless. So this, uh, this article that I have linked has instructions for you on how to set it up. 
on a Raspberry Pi. It is not different at all to set it up on a standard Linux VM, uh, but you are able now to run it as a chat or as a persistent share on the onion, on the, the dark web. Now, why don't you just put it on the ordinary web? Because you're sharing something illegal, I guess, is the only reason. Something illegal, or you want to do it for funsies, who knows? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's good to know how the technology works. Yes. Reminds me, you know, um, Kirk, one of our students that's well known, he was always wanting me to like run servers in my house and have students hacking in there. And I said, I don't think I want my house becoming the target of the students, you know? I like an air gap. <laughs> yes. And this might yeah. be an option for that, having a separate device. Mm -hmm. That's why I use cloud servers for all my targets. So they're not hacking directly into my home machines. <laughs> yep, yep. Someone else can deal with that, not us. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, that's good. I'm going to stop this one.